Part 3. Test Taking Tips Your Very Own Ruby Slippers. Introduction. Congratulations. You've completed the most difficult portion of getting to maybe. By contrast, we think you'll find the material in this part of the book, a series of tips on preparing for the exam chapter 11, writing exam answers chapter 12, and mistakes to avoid chapter 13, as well as answers to a number of frequently asked questions chapter 14, and a set of sample questions and answers chapter 15 relatively easygoing. Indeed, if you are short on time say, you've picked up this book in a moment of panic, the night before your first law school exam. We'd suggest focusing on these tips for now and turning to the rest of the book when the dust settles. But don't let the breezy style and accessible format fool you. Like dieting advice, these tips are much easier to explain than they are to follow especially in the high-pressure context of the typical law school exam. Although even a quick read might help dispel some of the misunderstandings you may have picked up from other sources, you'll get much more out of these tips if you learn how to use them and for most students that will take considerable practice. A good way to start is to work your way through the tips very carefully, paying special attention to the examples and illustrations we offer throughout. After that, we suggest that you give tip hash for a try, review the professor's old exams, and attempt to translate your understanding into action. Finally, if you find yourself stumped at any point, you can access the hypertext version of these tips online through our website at where you will receive guidance on how to email questions to us. Um, obviously, we can't answer every one, but we plan to respond to a representative sample of frequently asked questions. We bet that if something is bothering you, it will trouble enough others that will be addressing it sooner rather than later. Chapter 11 the tips that appear in this part of the book are designed as a supplement to good old-fashioned studying, not as a substitute for it. You aren't going to do well if you don't attend class, read the assigned material, and struggle to understand it case closed. Often, however, students who spend what should be adequate time preparing for exams don't study as efficiently as they might. And once you've read all the cases and reviewed your class notes until you just can't look at them anymore, what should you do then? Try these tips as a way of studying smart while you are studying hard. Tip hash 1. Exam preparation takes all semester. Here's the part where we tell you to prepare diligently for class, to attend class regularly, and to take good notes. We understand how tempting it is to ignore such advice. Of course a couple of law professors are going to tell you that you need to go to every class well prepared and to write down every word we say. But consider the possibility, however remote it might seem, that the reason we want you to do these things is not to torture you, but because we have reason to think that this is the best way for you to succeed in your legal studies. Indeed, when it comes to excelling on law school exams, we think this advice is second in importance only to tip hash 7. Read each question carefully and answer the question asked. Here's why. Regular class attendance is crucial to exam performance. It's a common perception among non-lawyers that law is a body of rules that law students must memorize and be ready to regurgitate on demand in law school and, ultimately, in legal practice. But if you've been a law student for more than a week, you've no doubt begun to figure out that rule memorization and regurgitation are of very little use in class discussion and that the emphasis is far less on what the rules are than on how lawyers and judges use rules to analyze and solve problems. For most students, this represents an abrupt departure from their undergraduate studies, where teachers frequently use class time to convey and perhaps clarify the same information contained in the reading for the course. By contrast, in law school, the assigned readings are typically only the starting point for the analysis. The professor pushes her students to undertake in class, and you can be sure that it is the analysis developed in class that will be carefully tested on the final. As a result, class attendance is generally the key to preparation for the typical law exam. If you have to miss a session, we recommend that you seek permission from the professor to have someone tape record it for you. A classmate's notes may do in a pinch. But even assuming you can read the writing and decipher the abbreviations, the best they can be expected to offer is only a glimpse of what you missed. The better your preparation, the more you'll get out of a class. 
Most law students quickly surmise that the cases and rules they are supposed to study in preparation for class are only the starting point for the analysis and discussion that actually take place in the classroom. But some students take this logic a step further. Since you can't learn the law's lessons simply by reading the assigned materials on your own, they figure, why bother reading those materials at all? Why not simply go to class and wait for the professor just to tell you exactly what you need to know? The problem with this thinking is that it assumes that the point of the law school classroom experience is to teach you what the cases and materials really mean, rather than to help you learn how to analyze, interpret, and argue about those materials and how to do so on your own. To be sure, if a particular class discussion is focused on a short and simple phrase e.g., a benefit previously received by the promiser under 86 of the second restatement of contracts, you may well be able to keep up with that discussion even if you are reading the phrase for the first time right there in class. But if the focus of the discussion is much broader than that like a complex statutory provision or a court's opinion or a line of cases you're in deep trouble. Like the blindfolded man who mistook the elephant's trunk for a snake, you're unlikely to get the details right and are even less likely to grasp the big picture. Attendance and preparation may be even more important at the end of the semester than at the beginning. The end of the semester is invariably serious crunch time, with paper due dates, makeup classes and professors rushing to get through their syllabi. Yet this is no time to let class attendance and preparation slip since the material presented during the last several classes of the semester is quite likely to appear on the final. For one thing, many professors teach their courses so that concepts and issues unfold in cumulative fashion, and as a result the final two or three topics may well bring together various themes and problems that the professor thinks are especially important and hence worth stressing on the exam. For another, most professors draft their exams at the end of the semester partly because we're procrastinators just like our students, but partly because we don't know what we'll test until we see what we've actually taught. In any event, it is only natural for us to focus our questions on the topics that are freshest in our minds, and the topics covered at the end of the course are likely to loom large in just this way. Tip hash 2. Focus your exam study on your class notes. The reading period is coming to a close, and you're pulling another late-nighter in the library. On one side of the desk is a beautifully printed, carefully organized commercial outline summarizing the main points of the topic you are studying. On the other side rests the virtually indecipherable chicken scratch that you call class notes. Although it's tempting to focus your flagging energy on the easy-to-read work of the so-called experts, don't do it. For at least two very important reasons, your class notes are your best bet. Most professors test what they teach. Despite the widespread suspicion that your professors are out to trick you, most of us endeavor to test exactly what we've tried to teach. Thus, while a high-quality commercial study aid may offer a useful overview of a particular area of the law, nothing will provide a more accurate guide to the particular topics and issues that your professor thinks are most important and is therefore most likely to examine than what she actually emphasized in class. Moreover, quite apart from the variety of course content, different professors focus their teaching on different lawyerly skills. Some will emphasize rule application and argument. Some will focus on policy analysis. Some will embrace a theoretical perspective. Some will stress fact sensitivity. And most will do some mixture of all four. Whatever your own professor's approach, you can be sure that it is not captured in any study aid unless she happens to be the author. As a result, your class notes are likely to be among your most valuable resources as you prepare for your exams. Your classmates can help you predict questions likely to appear on the exam. Many perhaps most law school exam questions are simply variations on hypothetical and problems discussed in class. So carefully working your own way back through those hypos and problems is an excellent approach to preparing for the final. Indeed, some professors will signal their intention to draw explicitly from a particular class discussion by warning the students that a problem like this will almost surely appear on the final. Obviously, it is a good idea to highlight such predictions in your class notes 
and to focus your study efforts accordingly. But your notes may contain subtler hints as to what will be tested as well. For example, it may be a good idea to pay special attention when the professor has gone back over particular material a second time perhaps in response to a particularly insightful question from you or one of your classmates, and has done so in a way that suggests she has developed a new way of looking at the topic in the course of teaching it to your class. In our experience, it is more likely than not that she will focus on such second thoughts somewhere on the final, since she may well have experienced her own rethinking as one of the highlights of the course. Tip hash 3. Prepare your own outline of the course. For virtually every law school course, there's a 1,000-plus page casebook, a statutory and or new case supplement, and an extraordinary number of hornbooks and other commercial study aids. If you were the publisher of all that material, you'd be rich. On the other hand, if you were the tree that generated the paper, not to mention the legal pads and notebooks that students fill to the brim with their case briefs and class notes, you'd be dead. As a law student, you are likely to spend a lot of time feeling more like the tree than like the publisher. For one thing, you've got to lug the stuff from class to class. For another, you've got to find some way to master the cases, the rules, the outside materials, and your accumulated class and reading notes in time for the final. And while there are countless more or less equally effective approaches to the former task, we've seen everything from backpacks to shopping carts, we can think of no better way to pull it all together for exams than to prepare your own outline for each course. Here's why. Law exams test rule application, not memorization. Let's start with the good news. No law school exam question we have ever seen or heard about asks students to quote back from memory an even moderately lengthy passage from a case or a statute. Accordingly, you don't have to worry about memorizing all those cases and rules and notes you have before you. What our exam questions test is not your recollection of the rules, but what you can do with them. That is, your ability to make arguments about how to interpret and apply the rules and concepts you've studied in a variety of real-world contexts. Thus, for example, you are highly unlikely to encounter a question that asks you to regurgitate from memory the definition of goods offered in UCC to 1051. Instead, you are likely to be asked to apply that definition to a variety of transactions. Sometimes the application will be straightforward e.g. to the book in which you are reading this. Sometimes the application will be tricky e.g. to the software program we use to produce it. Obviously, you will need to have a pretty good idea of what the rules are in order to apply them in either setting. But you can safely leave the task of memorizing vast quantities of text for regurgitation on demand to the interns and residents on Earth. Don't mourn organize. You're right if you are thinking that we've just delivered the bad news as well. Even though you don't need to memorize all those rules, you do need to master them well enough to be able to use them to analyze real-world fact patterns and that is no easy task. We think that the best way to do this is to prepare an outline for each course, an outline designed to help you remember the rules you've studied, and even more important, to help you to understand those rules. To recognize the difficulties you're likely to encounter in interpreting and applying them, and to see where they fit in the big picture of the subject matter your professor is attempting to teach. We've devoted a substantial section of Chapter 9 to the art of outline writing. What we've said there doesn't easily reduce to tip form, so we encourage you to work your way through that material if you wish to develop or improve your outlining skills. Write the outline yourself. The real point of an outline is not to have it, but to make it. In our experience, the very process of outlining of working your way back through the mass of course material and organizing it in a way that helps you make sense of it all may be the most valuable part of your legal studies. In fact, we boldly predict that the more time you spend drafting and redrafting an outline, the less time you'll spend actually referring to it during the final. Of course, if you're taking a closed book exam, you'd better not refer to your outline or to anything else, for that matter at all. But even on the far more common open book exam, you are likely to find that the outline has already done the job by helping you to learn the material in the process of organizing it, thus freeing up precious exam time for reading.
and rereading the questions and writing and refining your answers. Commercial study aids are a poor substitute. Although most law professors tend to sneer at hornbooks, canned outlines, and other commercial study aids, we concede that such materials can provide a useful supplement to your legal studies, provided you use them properly and recognize their limits. CFAC hash 8. Should you use commercial study aids? But one terribly important thing a commercial outline cannot do is provide you with the experience of organizing your own outline for a course. As we've said, we think the pulling it all together process is one of the most effective vehicles students have for learning the law. Moreover, a commercial outline is likely to fail you in a second, equally important respect. While a high-quality publication may well offer a useful general overview of a particular area of the law, your final exam is highly likely to focus on those topics and skills that your professor emphasized in class. As a result, an outline that draws on your own class notes is likely to be infinitely more useful than the one-size-fits-all version you can buy in a bookstore. Finally, commercial outlines emphasize what is clear and what is settled about the subject matter, whereas your professor is far more likely to test the unclear and the unsettled. If you organize it well, your outline can thus be a far better guide to your exam than a commercial product ever could be. Outlines prepared by other students are only marginally better. In our experience, the value of outlines prepared by fellow students runs the gamut from marginally useful to downright dangerous. Most law professors update, reorganize, and even rethink the material they teach often enough to make it far too risky to rely on an outline from earlier renditions, even very recent ones of the course. Indeed, an exam answer that draws on material the professor taught last year, but has taken the trouble to modify or transform for your class, is very likely to irritate her a lot. And that's something you never want to do to someone faced with the formidable task of grading a mountain of blue books. Outlines of the current course are obviously better, but their utility depends almost entirely on your personal role in their preparation. Thus, if your study group develops an outline through a genuine collective effort discussing and analyzing the entire course as a group, but perhaps divvying up topics for outlining among the individual participants, both the outline and the process of making it can be of genuine educational value. Even here, however, you are sure to find that your mastery of the material you outline yourself greatly exceeds your grasp of those parts of the course outlined by others. Once again, it is the process of outlining, and far less the product you produce, that makes a difference to exam performance. Indeed, preparing for the final by using an outline or a part of an outline that you did not write yourself, even if it is authored by someone you consider to be the class star, is like attempting to make the NBA by reading about Michael Jordan's practice regimen. To paraphrase the famous athletic shoe commercial, when it comes to the law school outline, it's not enough to have it or even to study it. The point is to do it. Tip hash 4. Review the professor's old exams. We believe that reviewing exams your professor has given in previous years is one of the most effective ways to prepare for finals. Prior exams, especially recent ones, are likely to reveal the issues the professor finds significant or interesting enough to examine, and they may offer clues as to format e.g. lengthy issue spotters vs. Short answer problems vs. policy questions as well as content. Simply put, nothing else not the most thorough studying. Not the most popular commercial outline. Not even the best book on exam taking this one. Can provide you with this kind of insight into your own professor's approach. We understand that looking at old exams can instill panic if done too early. When the questions will almost surely seem unimaginably difficult. Accordingly. You'll need to pick a time for this somewhere near the end of the course, though given the importance of the task, don't wait till the last minute either. But whenever you do it, by all means don't pass up your best opportunity to find out how your professor goes about the task of examining students. Gather knowledge about your professor. As much as we pride ourselves on the universal value of the advice offered in this book, it is no substitute for learning as much as you can about the way your particular professor gives and grades exams. Many professors make this easier by holding review sessions in which they describe in advance the format, if not the content, of the exam, 
and many more help you out by placing previous exams on file. If such exams are available, get them and go over them carefully, for you'll have no better guide to what this year's exam will be like than the questions that appeared on prior exams. Law professors are even less likely than leopards to change their spots. Don't wait until you are finished studying to look at an old exam. It's incredibly dispiriting to read a series of questions on topics you've never even heard of, so there's much to be said for waiting until you are well into a course before you start working your way through old exams. For upper-class electives, the counterpoint is that looking at old exams may be one way of deciding whether you are interested in the course in the first place. But we urge you not to leave this important task to the very last minute. Law school exams aren't meant to be easy, and even the best students will often feel at a loss until they actually begin working through an answer. Looking at old exams at some point early in your exam review will give you time to incorporate the professor's particular way of thinking into your studying. Also, if an old exam raises issues that appear unfamiliar to you, you'll have time to determine whether the surprise is the professor's fault i.e. she has changed the content of the class since last year or your own i.e. you missed something important in the course. Simulate the exam experience at least once. Let's face it. Taking exams isn't anyone's idea of fun. One reason is that a lot is riding on your performance. But it's precisely because a lot is at stake that we think it's important to practice taking an old exam. You wouldn't dream of giving a piano recital without sitting down in a quiet room and playing the piece all the way through several times prior to the big day. Neither should you go into an exam without putting yourself through the daunting, and even intimidating experience of being alone with your questions and your blank pages and blue books aren't necessary. Doing this will also give you an opportunity to practice budgeting your time among questions of varying difficulty and format. See tip hash 15. Watch time credit allocations. Go over old exams with your friends as often as you can. We can't stress this enough. In our experience, Many hardworking students who've been disappointed with their exam grades have turned out to be solo studiers. To be sure, working alone should play a crucial role in your legal studies. But once you feel confident about your basic understanding group sessions reviewing old exams are perhaps the best way to test your facility with the concepts. As most law professors and more than a few lawyers have learned over the years, there is no better way to discover the holes in your own thinking than by being forced to communicate your views to others. Moreover, studying old exams is one of those experiences that confirms the old adage two heads are better than one and more heads better still. Thus, no matter how good you think you are at seeing all the angles, you're sure to encounter many more if you work your way through a question from last year's exam with a small group of classmates who have varying perspectives on life and law. We understand, study group sessions can become needlessly competitive if each person insists on showing that his or her approach is the right one. But the way to deal with that problem is to talk about this danger in advance and agree collectively to avoid it. Indeed, you can vote with your feet and change study groups if you find you just can't make yours work for you. Tip hash 5. Consider what questions you would ask. It's often said that there is no better way to learn a subject than to teach it. After a combined quarter century of teaching, we're convinced that the most learning of all occurs when we sit down to write the exam. Exam writing forces you to look at the course as a whole, to identify the interesting issues, and to imagine where the law is headed. This is exactly the kind of thinking that can prepare you to take an exam as well. Here are some helpful hints for thinking about your courses from the top down, almost like a CEO would think about her company. We suggest you try them after you've spent a good deal of time mastering the course material from the bottom up. Pull the forests out of the trees. There is no substitute for knowing the material covered in your courses. But don't let a blizzard of detailed knowledge substitute for some quiet reflection. As the exam approaches, try to identify a small number of major issues that the professor has covered. Three to six would capture the typical law school class. Have dinner with a friend unfamiliar with law and, focusing on those issues, explain the course in broad strokes or try to before your friend falls asleep. 
For example, from this perspective, you might conclude constitutional law is about protecting individual rights from government intrusion, about dividing power between the national and state governments, and about allocating governmental power among the president, the Congress, and the courts. Crucial as they are, it is easy to lose sight of these broader themes when you are bogged down in the details of smaller points e.g. the rules governing the relationship between the Privileges and Immunities Clause and the Market Participant Doctrine. Then, force yourself to outline the major points the professor has tried to make about these recurring issues and about how. These issues are implicated in individual cases. Which theme or themes are at stake, for example, in deciding whether a particular plaintiff has standing to challenge a government action. A related exercise is to put yourself in the position of a professor who wants to see whether his students have grasped the principal themes of the course. You might imagine a conversation with one of your classmates. What questions would you ask her if you were trying to test her this way? Even if you can't predict the professor's questions with great precision, You'll find that this kind of thinking will help immensely in your preparation for the exam. Look for important cases pointing in opposite directions. Try to identify leading cases you have studied that take differing approaches to the same question of law. Based on similar facts, for example, one case might hold that a federal statute preempts state law, while another case rules that there is no preemption. Now see if you can invent a fact pattern that contains some elements of the first case and some of the second case. For example, your hypo and the first case might both deal with a problem requiring a uniform national standard of factor favoring preemption. But your hypo and the second case might deal with statutes whose wording suggests a less imperial congressional intention, a factor cutting against it. Such hybrid fact patterns form the core of many exam questions. If you do enough of them, you might even be able to approximate the questions you will actually encounter on the final. But even if you don't get that lucky, you'll be developing one of the key skills you'll need for top performance, because you'll know exactly what to look for on the exam. Identify underlying conflicts. Every body of law is aimed at solving real-world problems. If the solutions were easy, we wouldn't need much law in there. Wouldn't be a whole course devoted to the subject. What makes the problems hard is that there are often two or more important goals that are in some tension with each other. In property law, for example, we want rules that will make owners feel safe and secure in their investments, but we don't want rules that will ban all new competitors. In contracts for another, there is the tension between rules that promote freedom of action and rules that protect reliance on promises. In torts for yet another, there is the tension between limiting liability to actors who are at fault and expanding it to cover any and all harms one person causes another. Before the final, try to identify the key conflicts from your course and the situations you've studied where it's particularly difficult to reconcile those conflicts. It's a safe bet that your professor will be doing the same thing as she drafts your exam. Look for trends and limits. Law professors frequently identify trends in the topics they cover, priding themselves in their forecasts of issues that are likely to arise in the future and the direction the law may take. Don't be surprised if they ask you to do the same thing on your exams. Courses like labor law may make it easy to think in terms of pro-union or pro-management trends. But every course will have some issues in which patterns and directions can be detected even if they are not so obvious. In contracts, for example, the cases you've studied may reveal a recent trend toward enforcing the plain language of the contract, rather than understandings implicit in the transactional context. Similarly, you may have noticed or your professor may have emphasized that constitutional decisions are increasingly hostile to efforts by Congress to regulate local matters. A classic professorial ploy for gauging your grasp of such developments is to invent situations that push the envelope that test just how far this or that trend will go before countervailing policies or concerns are likely to limit them. In torts, for example, you might detect an increasing tendency to hold market actors responsible for damages they cause even when they are not at fault. Try to come up with situations that stretch the no-fault concept to the breaking point. 
Might gun manufacturers be held responsible when their products kill or cause injury, even if there was absolutely nothing wrong with a gun? Should an aspirin manufacturer be held liable if someone intentionally uses the aspirin to administer a fatal overdose? Questions like these frequently appear on law exams, and we can think of no better way of preparing for them than by attempting to come up with them on your own. Consult your casebook as a source of questions. During the press of class preparation, it's sometimes difficult to take time to focus on the problems in the casebook that typically appear at the end of textual material. These problems are designed to make you think hard about complex topics, and you may feel pressed to move on to the next section. As you begin your exam preparation, however, it's time to go back and look at these problems again. Many professors consult these problems as a source for writing exam questions. Indeed, if you are really ambitious, you might look at some of the problems and other casebooks for your course, which are usually available in the library. Even if your professor doesn't build a question based on any of the problems you study, this exercise is nonetheless terrific practice for the challenging problems you'll encounter on the exam. What interests you? Last, but not least, take a few moments to consider what you find most interesting about the course. What problems would you want students to grapple with if you were writing the exam? If you'll forgive us for indulging a professional conceit, much of what you know about the subject you've learned from the professor, so it wouldn't be a coincidence if the two of you have ended up on the same wavelength.